Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Street Church, whether you're here live or online. We're streaming today on Facebook, as well as recording, and we'll have that up on our website a little later on. Uh, Pastor Terry and Diane are out on a weekend together for some well-deserved time. Uh, they're taking their anniversary trip early this year because they won't be able to take it in November, so they're going to be out and about today and enjoying this absolutely gorgeous day. So I, I uh, can't say that I uh, am not a little bit jealous of them out there driving around and enjoying all the changing of the leaves and everything and, and having a great time together. And we got a lot of fun things coming up. Next Saturday is Orange Track Racing. And uh, so we have that right here. Uh, and registration starts at 9.30 and racing at 10 o'clock. And we are hot and heavy in the process of planning out our Thanksgiving dinner and what that's going to look like and everything. So uh, we enjoy your feedback. So if anyone has some input they would like to give on that, uh, we would truly enjoy having that. And we're trying to put a list together of who can be here when and, and who would be able to be here for the dinner when we go to serve that. So. If you would like to get together with myself or, or Shannon, she's helping uh, coordinate some of this as well. So if, if you can do that, that would be great. Our Advent study for Max Lucado showed up this week, uh, or I should say part of it did. Uh, I guess the most important part, our books are still uh, floating around through the mail system somewhere, uh, but we'll have those available and ready to go. And it looks like it's... Uh, uh, going to be a great study from what I've previewed already on it. It, it looks really, really good. So, And we're going to be having a Planning for Christmas church dinner. And thanks to Denise and Steve, they went out and checked with the people at Pizza Ranch. And we can get the, bit of the room in the back. Uh, and uh, so we'll be putting together a date for that here coming up. And doing some planning there as well. So let's open up today's worship with a word of prayer, should we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we just praise you and thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us today. This is the day that you have made and we need to rejoice. We need to be glad in it. We need to be glad for the blessings that you give us each and every day. Lord, we come before you today and we ask that your word would fall on fertile ground. Lord, take this word that you have and the message that you have and Put it in our hearts and in our minds to carry forward through the week and into the world as we face a world that sometimes is somewhat unforgiving. But Lord, you're with us there all the time. You are here in our hearts through your spirit. We praise you and thank you for that, Lord. So we ask that we would receive your word today into our hearts. Open our ears to be able to hear our eyes to see the glory of your world that you have for us today. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So our call to worship today is from John 16, 22. And we kind of prefaced this a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about this scripture, and I want to bring it back up today, because it's very, very relevant for what we're going to talk about. And today, the word's message, we're in week three of our study on uh, I Still Believe, coming through the movie, and... Uh, so I wanted to, to bring that here because uh, the theme of today is you are here and it deals with grief and loss. And uh, it comes at a very apropos time with all the things that have happened here in, in recent weeks. But John 16, 22 says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And you really need to hold on to that because that promise from God is really, really, truly an anchor for our faith. That is an anchor for our faith. It's more than just a promise, but it's something that we can hold on to and carry forward in our lives. And what a contrast it was for the disciples and the world when we take a look at it because Jesus is speaking to his disciples at this point in time. And the contrast is that the world was rejoicing as the disciples wept over the death of Jesus. But see, the disciples 
would see Jesus again in three days when he rose from the dead. And they would rejoice in it. So they fulfilled these words from John. And the world's values are, are typically opposite from what they are of God's values for the most part. This can cause Christians to kind of feel like misfits at times and just like they just don't seem to fit into what the world has and what the world expects. But even if life is difficult now, one day as believers, we will rejoice. And so therefore we need to keep our eye on the future and God's promises and anchor ourselves to that promise that we have joy despite what we face in life today. We have that promise of joy. So don't let anybody steal your joy. So today we, we're filled with a day full of sunshine out here. And it lightens our heart compared to these days that we've had with kind of dismal and cold and spitting rain and wind. And, you know, we're just not ready for that yet. We're not ready, but it is autumn and that's kind of weather we're going to have. But today we've got a day of sunshine. And it's going to be a little bit warmer today. And we can get out and enjoy the day. We're on days when it's a little bit more dismal. It's really, really hard to kind of set your tone for the day when it's dismal. And you get up to go to work and it's dark outside. And you have to use your headlights to go to work. And you go to come home at night and it's dark outside. And you got to use your headlights to get home. And so as the days grow shorter, it's been shown in... A uh, number of studies there that it, it really physiologically affects us and how we operate, how we function day to day. So as the days get shorter and darkness surrounds us, our attitudes and everything, and physiologically, it takes on a, a meaning of its own and it kind of brings us down a little bit in our attitude. So when we have a day full of sunshine and bright, it moves all that darkness away. Sound familiar? Yeah, it's that promise that God has for us. So as light comes into our lives, it changes us physiologically to feel better and to do better and to act better. And so when we think about the darknesses that can come into our lives, whether it's a meteorological condition where the sun is shining bright or it's being dark outside, or whether we have a darkness in our lives caused by an issue or a problem that we're facing at this point in time, we have to always understand that as that light moves into our life, the darkness will fade away. And that's something that we can hold on to. And in Romans 8, 26 and 27, we're going to kind of concentrate on that scripture today. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our moments of weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes through us in wordless groans. And we kind of talked through some of that last week. And he who searches our hearts knows the minds of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So as we go through our, our daily rituals and we go through the things that, that work for us and work against us, the Spirit of God, that Spirit of holiness, that we have as believers resides within us and intercedes on our behalf when we get into times when things are going to be tough. And, you know, it's happened many, many times in my life where, you know, I couldn't leave the office in time. And I, you know, I was just bogged down with stuff. And so I stayed late. And it turns out on my way home, if I hadn't done that, I could have been involved in a big car accident or a pileup. And see, that's another way that the, that the Holy Spirit intercedes with us. And it's God going ahead of us and protecting us on our way. And it's that kind of little tugging at your heart. Well, I can't really leave right now. And then all of a sudden, boom, hey, time to go. And away we go. And we go safely on our way. And that intercession that the Holy Spirit does on our behalf works that way and it works within prayers. So even when we seem to be bogged down and we can't really see a way out 
And then we get this kind of warm feeling and kind of an inner nudging. And that is the Holy Spirit interceding and working on our behalf. And as we go through our lives, we all have dates that trigger memories for us. And some of the dates and sources are sources of celebration and joy. And other ones are dates that we kind of circle on the calendar. And they're kind of dates that we would never have wished for. A morning when everything changed. A day when you heard that news that flipped your world upside down. The day in time that changed everything. Maybe right now that date is at the forefront of your mind. And for the next few minutes, as I read some significant dates in my own or our own community and, and some of the things that happened to us, I want you to be thinking about what those dates might be for you. What dates are really, really important in your life that you just seem to hang on to? And when they come, you know that those dates are really, really important and have changed your life. So some of the dates that have changed the world, uh, our last month we had an anniversary date of a date that most of us experienced firsthand. And for most of us, it changed our lives and it will change us for the rest of our lives. And more above that, that that trigger of that event, of that date in time, actually literally changed the world as we know it. And that would be 9-11. And if we think about all the things that have changed in our world since that event of 9-11, all the security programs and protocols that had to be put into place, airport lockdowns, all of the things that travel restrictions, all the things that we have to do now that we take for granted, we never had to do before that date and time. And it forever changed our world as we know it. Not just the United States, not just us personally here, but the world. That one event changed the entire world for all of time. So that's one. Personally, I can remember a few more that, that kind of trigger and stick in my, my mind. I remember the call that came from the nursing home in the middle of the night that told me that my mother had passed away. And I remember thinking, how am I going to break the news to my dad? How am I going to break the news to the rest of the family? And then this last December, I got the call that my brother was only going to make it a very short amount of time, maybe an hour, maybe minutes to live the week before Thanksgiving. And again, I had to think, how am I going to tell my family? How am I going to break this news to them? And you know, in the pit of your stomach, it just, your whole world changed at that point. And I think for all of us, we've gone through some of those times and some of those memories. Last week, Lori and I went to Dad's house to take him some dinner. And we got there and we found out that his little dog had died. And I'm thinking, how am I going to break the news to Dad? Because that little dog was his life. After Mom left, that dog got him through his really, really hard time. And again, I had to go in and say, hey, Dad, you know, Lily passed away. And those things are hard. And, and it's hard because I know that, that it was going to cause him pain. And he was going to suffer grief. And it's a tough thing to have to bring that message to bear. And then yesterday morning, I got a call from Stephanie Johnson that Lori had passed away suddenly. And, you know, I, I, I was in shock because I was at Lori and Bruce's house a week ago on Friday and we had a really nice talk and, and everything. There was no indication whatsoever that that was going to be the last time that I would see her alive. That would be the last time that I would ever be able to talk to her again. And 
for those of you who know Lori, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, she and Bruce were a couple that helped us found Prayer Prepare Share Ministries. And so it really struck hard. And so I, I, I reached out to Bruce and, and Stephanie and I prayed on the phone and, and uh, offered my help for them, whatever I could do. And that event will be a life-changing event because I know that I will never be able to talk to Lori that way again. But at the same time, we need to understand that these events, these tragedies that come in our life, they can strike at any time without notice, without warning. And so we have to prepare our hearts. And we have to hold on to that verse and those verses I read you in John and in Romans today. Because they become very important to us as we face these difficulties in life. We need those things to be able to hang on to, to get us to ride out the storm, to bring light back in to that sudden darkness that came into our lives. And I think for those of you who have had experienced that date of significant tragedy, it was probably the date that you called out the loudest to God. Where are you? Where are you? And, you know, in that midst of the grief and the hurt and the pain, a lot of us would probably say, God, how could you let this happen? How could you do this to me? How could you do this? Where are you, God? But see those verses that we read today? God's there. He's always there. He's always there. So the title of the sermon this morning is, You Are Here. And if you ever go to travel somewhere, and you go into a rest stop and it has a big map on the wall that says, You Are Here. And, and so most of the times we kind of think about that. We, we uh, kind of tend to think about, I'm here at this point in time, at this place. But I want you to think about it a different way. And that would be that we're, we can say that same thing about God. See, when we're at that time and that place, and it's a dark place, and it's a hard place, we can say to God, you are here. We can stand firm on that. That is a promise that God will never leave us, forsake us, or betray us. He is there in spirit with us each and every day, every step of the way, we have that promise that we can build our lives upon. So we've all had dates that probably are prominent in, in our lives. Uh, dates when your father walked out of your home, when divorce papers suddenly arrived, or when the police arrived at a doorstep when your friend delivers the news you never wanted to hear. When the biopsy came back positive for cancer. Dates when you learned your life would be forever changed, whether you wanted it to or not. And if you've ever been there, where you felt like you had the wind knocked out of you with one, one fail swift blow, then you know that at that point in time, even to utter a single word or trying to describe to somebody what's going on, feels like you're trying to run a marathon in mud. Running a marathon in mud. Life can get tough at times. And that's why I love those two verses, those verses that I read earlier, the one in John and the one in Romans. And as we discuss these verses today, I hope that they give you or someone else who might be going through those tough times, someone to learn to love the freedom to process your grief through the various circumstances in your life. When those words have grown really, really few and the weight of the world seems to be overwhelming to you. 
you still have those words that you can fall back on. So if you have your Bibles open today, open it up to Romans 8, 26 and 27. And it says in there, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So if you were here last week with us and we had Pastor Terry and he was going through the different uses of the word groan and he gave you two different examples last week. Groaning, as we said last week, often signifies something that is that should not really be as it is. And in Romans 8, there's three distinct uses of that word groan. And last week we talked about the groaning of all creation, and he gave several really good examples of the groaning of creation. And the inward groaning of our bodies that long for a day when the sting of sin has disappeared. It's no longer part of your story. And we talked about that on Wednesday night. We we're talking about the things that go on in our lives, and a lot of the tough things that we end up going through are the result of choices we made. And that God is writing our story through our entire life, and it isn't just that everything's all written out and then we just kind of follow the script. But God writes our story as we go, and a lot of times we face the troubles in life because we stole the pen from God, and we tried to write our own story. And we tried to follow ourselves instead of following the will of God or, or following our hearts as that Holy Spirit is guiding us because that Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I talked about, man, you got to stay late at work for a little bit so you miss the accident coming up. That's that Spirit interceding in accordance with God's will. So as we said last week, those two groanings, those two types of groanings indicate that things are not as they should be. But these groanings can also produce in us a steadfast faith and hope when we allow our awareness of them to develop our dependence on God. And I know I said that pretty fast. Those groanings can also produce in us a steadfast faith and hope when we allow our awareness of them to develop our dependence on God. Hmm. Get rid of the self-reliance and have more reliance on God. And guess what? That spirit does wonders and works wonders in our lives and in our hearts. So the final use of the word groaning that I'm going to talk about today is groaning of the spirit. And if we remember back in June, I did a whole series on the Holy Spirit. And I talked about that, and in June I talked about grieving the Spirit, and when we talk today about the groaning of the Spirit, it's a little bit different, so I don't want you to get the two confused. And this isn't in a groaning of pain or anticipation, but rather it's a groan of understanding and a groan of intimacy. Meaning we have that relationship bond established between ourselves and God. And it's that little tug on our heart that says, mm. some people call it a mind of conscience. And so, you know, your conscience is tugging at you. Yeah, that's probably not really the correct thing that you really want to do right now. But it's also that bond of intimacy with God that, that leads you to do things in accordance with God's will to reach out to someone to make sure that they are okay if they didn't show up for Bible study or to go on and visit a friend that you haven't been able to talk to for quite a long time. So maybe you didn't uh, leave on, the friendship wasn't on the best of terms when you left. 
and you had that tug in your heart that says, I really need to reach out and talk to that person. In my experience, usually when that happens, it's because God needs you in their lives at that moment in time so that you can intercede into their lives and help them in the struggle. As I've talked about many, many times, that community that we have. To lift each other up and to edify. And to edify, that term means to build up. It's the term, that's where we get the word edifice or building. That's where that term comes from, is edify to build up that other person. It doesn't build ourselves up, it builds them up. But in the process of doing that, we get blessed by God. And it warms our heart. That's an intimacy of spirit. That's where we get that good feeling inside, is that intimacy of spirit that indwells in us. So when we talk about that intimacy of the Spirit, we talk about the groaning of the Spirit, we can't talk about that without focusing some of our time on the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And one of the ways that the Holy Spirit is described to us as the Holy Spirit is an advocate for us. Okay, if we remember back to my sermons, and hopefully I didn't put you to sleep in June, but the Holy Spirit advocates to God on our behalf. And that's what we call about intercession, someone going between us to God. That's an intercession. So this person is not acting on their own behalf, but some, someone or something else is acting on their behalf. And that's an intercession. And with any advocate, sometimes we hear and understand what they're speaking about, and other times the advocate's expertise is beyond our understanding. And they utilize that expertise for our good. So it might be that we don't have expertise in a certain area, so we go and consult with someone who can help us out in that area. Because their expertise far exceeds our own experience in life and our own level of expertise. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us with God. Because the Holy Spirit is one with God. As we build our relationship to God, that becomes a closer and closer and closer relationship. The intimacy level between our relationship between us and God grows through the Holy Spirit interceding and advocating on our behalf. Kind of neat, isn't it? God's got great plans. Sometimes we got to hand the pen back and let God finish writing the story. So Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit itself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The characteristic of the Spirit is important to recognize because it means that not only is the Spirit advocating on our behalf, but the Spirit is constantly reassuring our spirit of our place as God's children. And it's really important to see that familial relationship, that family relationship between us and God. And here's why it's important. Because God is a good father. And through the cross, we've been adopted as his children. Through that selfless sacrifice that Jesus made, the Son of God, God personified in person, we then become children of God. And a good father takes care of his children even when they don't know what they need. So, case in point, if you ever think about it, I want you to think about toddlers right now. Toddlers. And if you've ever had toddlers, some of us may have been single, but you've probably been subjected to toddlers. And they do nice screaming, hissing, fits, tantrums, kicking and screaming and everything. And it usually means that they really need a nap. They really need that nap. 
And see, as a good parent, you would recognize those signs and hopefully convince that toddler that it's time to try and take a nap. Sometimes it works, other times not so well. But see, that, that's what I'm talking about is, is a good parent knows the child well and can easily decipher what the needs are of that child based on their behaviors. And so a lot of times it's kind of fun and, and COVID has kind of ruined it for me, but uh, my little granddaughter just turned one. So as we've been able to see her kind of infrequently as well, my daughter Kelly always intercedes and, and so she's explaining all of, all of little Gwen's, we call her little penguin, but all of little Gwen's little idiosyncrasies. So she's, she's interpreting all of Gwen's idiosyncrasies so we, we can understand what's going on. And it becomes kind of comical at times because, you know, Kelly, you were my daughter. I went through the same thing with you, so I kind of understand. But it's a good parent that recognizes those things and then can interpret and that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit recognizes what's going on in our lives and interprets to us. And it's a two-way communication between us and God and between God and us. It's kind of neat how that works. And so often we can't put words to the emotions that we have within our soul. And I think rather than recognize the power within these kind of verses that we have here, we often settle for having a numbed heart and soul because we don't know how to give it to God. We don't know how to turn over that situation that we're going through, that we're faced with. We don't know how to turn it over to God. And so we sit there just kind of numb awestruck. I was that way for probably a good five minutes yesterday morning when Stephanie called me and said that Lori had passed away. And, I, and I, you know, the, the initial shock is there. But then the next thing that popped into my head was, I need to pray for them. I need to lift them up and I need to edify them because of what they are going through. I need to shine light in the midst of that darkness. And I don't think that's all Mark just doing it on his own because I'm not that good. I was still in shock, but the Holy Spirit was urging me to go and pray because that is what they needed. The Holy Spirit was advocating, intercessing on their behalf to me, to let me know that even though I was in shock, even though I was numbed down by that, that that is what God's will was. See how that life, that verse comes to life? These words of God, they, they are there to guide and direct our hearts and direct our lives. And the word of God is living and true. Open your minds, open your hearts understand it and receive it. So in, in Romans in here, we talk about how Paul said essentially when the Holy Spirit prays that he has a tone and that if you could hear him, it would sound like groanings and the word is more literally translated, or translated as a strong, heartfelt desire. Sound familiar? Have you ever had that? That little tugging inside. Another way that it's translated, in, and that's why I kind of like looking at the different translations that are out there. But if we, if we look at that Greek instead of the Hebrew, because that was Hebrew. If we look at the Greek, it's translated as begging with tears. Begging with tears. And I love that because it tells me how the Holy Spirit, how much the Holy Spirit cares for us. And I could just see the visual of that, of the Holy Spirit, you know, bowing down on his knees to God, begging with tears for God to supplicate, to, to be able to give what is needed in that situation. So 
So he is begging with tears. He's talking to God with a strong, heartfelt desire for you and me. Wanting to see our lives align with what God's will is, even when we can't see it, even when our hearts are numb, even when we're in shock, even when we can't see through it. The Holy Spirit is there, begging with tears, with heartfelt desire. And one of my fears about Christians today in our Christian culture is the feeling that we need to have perfect prayers. And, you know, I was taught a long time ago, we were in a seminar one time, and, and they said, this is the way that you should pray. And, you know, you have to follow this, and you have to do this next, and then it has to be this, and then it has to be this. Jesus gave us a great example of how to pray. But it didn't have to be in any certain order. And throughout the word of God, throughout the, the scriptures, it tells us that we are to pray continuously. And it doesn't say you have to follow this and this and this and this and make it a perfect prayer every time with a steady cadence and deep spiritual posture. Because I fear that that leads to predictable prayers that we simply say out of memory, out of rote experience. Rather than praying from our heart, praying with heartfelt desires to communicate to God. Because see, prayers are just that. They're communication to God. It's not a checklist. It's not a want list. It's not, hey, Santa Claus, I want this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Give it to me, God. No, it has to be a heartfelt desire. Begging with tears to communicate to God. Sometimes that's exactly what we need. And it's amazing if we open our hearts and open our minds to listen to when God speaks back to us. Amazing. It can get us through the toughest of times. And sometimes you're dead sound asleep. Four o'clock in the morning. By the way, Mark, you're going to change the sermon for today. And I do. And I mean, the message comes screaming through. And I change. And I changed. Lord, you can test to that. I start writing the message and then God talks to me and talks to me and talks to me. And usually I go through two or three iterations of a sermon before it's ever given. And that's kind of refining, I think it's refining me and getting me out of it and getting God into the message that someone needs to hear today. So prayer is so much more than just a phrase on your lips. It's a posture for your heart. It doesn't need to be a rote checklist. It doesn't need to be memorized. It doesn't have to be formalized. It needs to come from your heart. Romans 8, 26 said, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And I hope you can grab onto that this morning. I hope you can grab onto that. Especially of the Holy Spirit is to be with you when your strength is sapped out. His best work is when we are in our worst state. That's such great news because the Holy Spirit helps you in your distress. It's not a I hope or wouldn't it be great if, but it's a fact. And wherever you are right now, whatever you're going through, you don't need to be a perfectly polished person with a perfectly polished prayer for the Holy Spirit to help you. At this very moment, he is our divine translator. He knows our idiosyncrasies and he's translating those to God. And at our toughest times, if all we can do is get out a tear, he understands. If all you can do is go to sleep because you have no energy, 
and he can't make any sense of it, he understands what's going on. He knows the deepest parts of who we are, and he speaks to God on our behalf. He connects our heart to God. I just love that image because some of you are probably in the middle of this right now. Right now, today. And you've experienced those present sufferings that I talked about in my sermon a couple of weeks ago. You experience those present sufferings in such a degree that when you try to pray, it just comes out, God. Because you can't go any further. You can't stop. You, you've stopped praying because your grief is so heavy. And the loss is so evident. And for me, when life seems to be throwing a lot of curveballs, I also find myself in John 16 where he talks to his disciples before going to the cross. Because, see, that is an encouragement by what he chose to say knowing that those were going to be some of his last words to them. We never know when the tragedy is going to strike. And that's why I chose what I chose for a call to worship today. At the beginning of John 16, Jesus tells the disciples that there would be rough times ahead. He tells them their lives will be threatened, that people will want to kill them. He tells them that they will be misunderstood and misjudged. He tells them there will be grief and great heartache. You know, and if I'm being honest with you here today, every time I get to this point in John 16, I find myself thinking, this doesn't get me really excited as being a Christian. And if I was John, I'd be like, Hey, I'm going back fishing. I'm going to go back fishing. This sounds terrible. It sounds like it's going to be filled with grief and loss, and it feels like it will be full of trouble and testing. But then all you got to do is you got to read a little further on. And Jesus tells them all these things when we get to John 16, 20. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And then just a few verses later, in 22, he says, So also you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And then we finish up in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you may have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. What a statement of victory that we can hold on to. What a statement of victory that we know we win in the end. No matter what hits us now, no matter what the troubles are, no matter what the trials are, God's already won the battle. Christ has won. The battle has been done. And I don't want you to miss this, that Jesus has overcome what is overcoming you. Jesus has already overcome what is overcoming you. Right now, if you can hear him over the wailing that he isn't here, he doesn't exist, those people who are lost in the world, we know better. We have that promise that we stand in and we build our lives on, the rock that we build our life on. When the grief and loss have brought you to a place that words cannot describe, I want you to give you a phrase today, a phrase of, of a surrender that you can make your own. And it's this. I can't, but you can. Please help me. I can't, but you can. Please help me. Let that Holy Spirit pick it up from that point. 
and say, let me talk to God for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you would put it upon our hearts. We pray that the Holy Spirit would work within our lives each and every day. That we would become self-aware of these things. So that we know the blessings you give us. So that we know that you are working in our hearts and in our lives today. Lord, help us to be that person that you have us to be. Take the pen back. Take it away from us. And write your will upon our lives. Thank you, Lord, for these promises that we can build our lives upon. Thank you for the Holy Spirit dwelling within us that gives us the path to freedom, to grace, to mercy, and to your unfailing love. In your precious and holy name I pray today. So as we come to our time now for communion, we need to think about that unfailing love, that sacrifice. We need to go back ourselves and look at those words that Jesus told his disciples right before he was given up. He knew that he was going to be sacrificed. He knew he was going to die. He knew that this was going to be one of the last times that he was ever going to be able to talk to them before he was crucified. And in so doing, he gave them promises. And promises that they needed to share with the believers. And if we go to 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it says that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. A little later on in the meal, he took a cup and he had filled it. And after he blessed it, he said, this is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And later on, he said that I will not drink of, of this cup and eat of this bread until I come again anew into the world. Those promises of hope, those promises of love, shed for us to give us that freedom, to give us the promises that we can build our lives upon, the body and the blood of Christ. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Now we come for in the time of our service for our agape time, our prayers for the people. sightings this week that you'd like to talk about, I'd bring the mic to you and have you talk about that. Well, I know that there are a lot of people here um, hurting. I know that Mark and Lori have lost a good friend. I know that Harold needs to have a surgery. And I know that Denny has a, a sister who is um, beginning with Alzheimer's. And, um, through the sermon that Mark was giving this morning, God reminded me that there is hope. And there's this little story I just want to tell you. It's, it's very insignificant, but it, it brings hope to my mind when I'm, in, when I'm sad. Um, during the Dre show that morning, 
I went out. I love flowers, and we have flowers all over our yard. And we had this one vine that's been growing for two years, and that morning there was five beautiful flowers on that vine. So I went out, took a picture of it. It was absolutely gorgeous. And um, not knowing what was going to happen that day, you know. And so in the afternoon, you know, after the storm, I come home and all our flowers are, are gone, except for a basket of flowers that had just flown off and just landed upright. And I looked at the tree, our oak tree, our giant oak tree was still standing with limbs gone and they're all over our yard and we lost three big trees and, and one small one. But I looked at that vine and there were still two beautiful flowers on that vine. I was just, you know, you're in shock because of all the terrible things that happened, but that gave me joy and it gave me hope. And I knew God was with us. God did not destroy us that day. And, um, and I know that, you know, we will have trials on this earth and a lot of us have lost loved ones. And, um, but I know there's a God in heaven and we will see them someday. So let us pray. Father God, just bring the Holy Spirit into this place, into our hearts, into our minds, and just uh, comfort us with your joy today and your peace that passes all understanding. For we know with you there is hope. Without you, there is nothing. So um, just comfort our hearts, Lord Jesus. Be with those that are going to have surgery. Just prepare the way that they need to. Um, the doctors, prepare the doctor's hands so that they will do the best work possible. And um, just comfort the people and give them peace in their hearts. Because I know that you are there with us. And thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace that you gave us by dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, thank you, Denise. Um, this will conclude our, our live streaming portion of the service today. And uh, we thank those of you who have joined in to uh, uh, worship with us today. And we pray that God's grace and peace will be with you in the week to come.